Chief Executive of AP Miller Maersk, Zan Skoll, with us today. Uh, welcome, Zan. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I would like to remind to uh, all the viewers out there that it's possible to ask questions in the chat. Um, so I'll try and uh, put a couple of those in uh, during, during our, our conversation. Um, so I'd like to I'd like to kick off with a very present um, topic in relation to the uh, to the damage on the on the gas pipelines in the in the Baltic Sea. Uh, now the concern is, of course, that the, this damage to maritime infrastructure will will escalate. Um, so um, I was hoping you could you had any thoughts on on what this could mean for for maritime maritime traffic um, if if it escalates and and if you're doing anything to increase safety. Yeah, so so uh, obviously, given the uh, uh, the the three or four explosions that that we that we have seen, uh, there are areas of the Baltic Sea we now have to to navigate around uh, in the in the very short term, and and it's it's quite easy for for the ships to to do that. So the short term impact for shipping is is not really uh, significant in any any sense. Uh, the broader and more concerning perspective for all of us, of course, is how these things can happen and uh, and 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 whether it will escalate uh, from, from from here are you doing anything to at this point to increase safety um, for for you seafarers no no we are following the um, the recommendations uh, uh, in terms of uh, navigation that we are getting from the uh, danish and swedish uh, authorities making sure that we leave plenty of space between the ships and these uh, these uh, areas where gas is uh, coming out of the out of the ground, so to speak. Okay, okay. So I'd like to move to uh, to, to the, the big issue of um, of congestion in in global shipping. Uh, we know about uh, continued problems with bottlenecks at, at ports uh, as a result of the pandemic. Um, lately, freight rates have started to come down, um, and so the surge uh, in consumer spending that we saw. Uh, after the the lockdowns uh, seem to to have come to a halt, um, so Sun, maybe you could uh, give us a status of of how this situation is looking uh, from your side, both at sea and and at land uh, and in ports, of course, with, with regards to bottlenecks. Yeah, clearly, when we go back to to the beginning or late twenty twenty or beginning of two thousand and. 21, where everything uh, really uh, took off uh, from a demand and congestion point of view, we had a we had a bullwhip effect of uh, you know on the one hand sharply increasing uh, demand for for goods for products around the world, partly driven by lots of financial stimuli into the economy, and at the same time as uh, supply of uh, labor. Uh, was constrained because of the pandemic, because people actually being ill or being restricted from going to to work. So we had that double double effect of both more demand and less supply. Uh, right now, it's it's working in the other direction. So we have uh, significantly less demand, uh, particularly for du durable goods, where uh, many have already made their purchases and they don't need another. Uh, flat screen or another uh, another uh, washing machine or another new couch, uh, but and and at the same time we see uh, labor coming back uh, because there are no uh, no restrictions. With that being said, of course we still have congestion in the in the uh, in in the global supply chains. We still see areas where we have um, uh, you know ships waiting outside ports, lack of labor. We've had some strike or strike action in particular in 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 Europe. So the situation is is not normalized yet, but it's clearly getting uh, getting better, better. And and for us, that's really a, a good thing that that you know we're starting to be able to offer a better service to our customers. Okay, uh, we already have one question in 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 this uh, in relation to this from from a viewer. So regarding um, freight rates, um, are they so spot spot rates? That is, uh, are they falling uh, faster than? Than you expected, uh, uh, and do you have any thoughts on on when spot rates will stabilize? I think we've we've said all the time that we uh, we expected the the normalization where, when it was when it were to come to come uh, relatively rapidly, but because we would have this effect of both uh, both uh, a drop in demand 
and also uh, a, a release of of capacity from from congestion and uh, so so exactly the opposite of what happened in in early 2021 we're now seeing where we have uh, less demand and more, uh, more more supply so that that means that we will have a rap relatively rapid um, uh, rapid uh, normalization if you will of 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 freight rates we don't see anything uh, inverse to change uh, the view we have for 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 this year in terms of how we have guided our uh, the development uh, uh, in 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 results uh, we also don't see any 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 view to to change the the guidance or the the perspectives we provided at our capital markets day in 2021 where we said we expect our you know our ocean business to to you know also you know across the cycle uh, to make uh, you know a, a re return an ebit margin return of more than uh, more than six and six and a half percent okay and and with regard to to activity levels and and volumes um, headed into to to the big Christmas season. How is that? How does that look compared to <clears throat> normal years? Yeah. So so I already talked about durable goods, where we clearly see uh, demand globally being down, dr driven probably not so much by recession or uh, uh, inflation, but more from the fact that there was an over uh, uh, over uh, over demand uh, during the, the pandemic, where many of us were not able to to travel and spend money on services, and and we all upgraded our house uh, in different different ways. Uh, of course, you don't do that every year, so 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 that will mean have an impact on on durable goods. Uh, but clearly, we see uh, the impact also in Europe and and also to some degree in the US uh, of uh, of the recession, meaning that the consumers. Uh, are not able to to you know buy quite the same amount of things uh, as before because of increasing prices, and in Europe, of course, uh, added, we add, can add to that that the consumer confidence is probably quite uh, negatively influenced by the war that is going on on our on our doorsteps. So 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 uh, weak uh, weakening uh, weakening demand, and um, and on top of that, we have the recession threat. Okay, so so volumes headed into the Christmas season are are lower than than a normal year. Would you would you say? Yeah, it, you know we've we've had the cyclicality, the normal cyclicality of our business or global trade has been almost you know has been suspended for the last couple of years because we we you know we have been buying products at in large volumes at times of the year where we don't normally do and that has meant perhaps that the christmas trade then is is less than what it had been and and i th i suspect also we'll have quite a quite a if you will a modest uh, uh, pick up in, in in terms of, of christmas trade uh, this year okay so you you're talking about a, a, a normalization um and you and I uh, discussed this before, uh, you know, at previous uh, press conferences. Um, you know, at this point, um, with the worsening uh, economic situation, uh, does it look more like a hard landing uh, uh, now than, than just a normalization? From from first, we expect uh, to continue to see, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a modest development or weak demand on the ocean side, but we also continue to. To, to to grow continue to grow very rapidly uh, on on the land side logistics uh, side, you know uh, uh, as as you know we our land side our, our logistics business has grown more than more than thirty percent uh, organically in the last uh, six quarters in a row and and I think the se seventh quarter is probably in the making uh, on 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 that and and um, and and that's that's really because the pandemic has has change the way most of our customers think about uh, their supply chains. They want much more integrated solutions, much more uh, into in much more control. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's really what, what we are providing. So, so I, I, I don't see a hard landing in, in, the, in, in, in that respect uh, to, to the contrary, we expect to continue to see, to see uh, lots of growth on the logistics side. Also, if you know, and decoupled, if you will, from from uh, global trade growth uh, on our on our bit for us for us, uh, but but obviously volumes in, in, in ocean will be uh, you know flat or 
or, or even de uh, declining probably uh, this this year. Okay. 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 So, uh, can can you uh, quantify the uh, what you expect in in the drop in in global container demand uh, this year? I believe we at our uh, last uh, quarter uh, expected somewhere between plus minus. Uh, one percent uh, in in global global demand, and and that's also what we continue to to see. Okay, okay. And obviously, fuel costs uh, have risen, and that is something you would normally um, uh, pass on to pass on to the customer. But are you doing any? Are you trying to save costs on on shipping fuel? So for our business, we have a very large share of our. Uh, if you will, book a business in 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 ocean being on contract based, and all of our contracts have uh, fuel adjustment clauses. So, so our exposure to rising or falling, for that matter, uh, fuel cost is not that significant uh, any any anymore. But obviously, uh, we continue to drive very hard on uh, in terms of of fuel efficiency. We've we've been working on fuel efficiency in Maersk since two thousand and eight. Uh, in a very uh, dedicated uh, and, and disciplined way. Today, we are, we're using around 43% less fuel per container uh, we shipped than we did in 2008. And that, we believe, has potential to go to 60% uh, by, by 2030 by continuing to, to work with uh, fuel efficiency in new, new equipment, uh, new ways of operating, better decisions, better design of our network, and, and, and so on. So, so, so the whole fuel agenda, it's not only about uh, moving to green fuels and uh, it's, it's also about just limiting the amount of uh, fuel that we use. That's all, that also makes sense when we get to the green fuels because every ton of fuel is quite costly. Okay, okay. So, um, you know, ex excuse my ignorance of about how, how, con you know, how, how containers are, are moved around, but are we, also considering the, the bottlenecks at ports, um, are we at a point where uh, it makes sense for ships to go slower in order to save fuel? Is that what's happening now? Uh, clearly, I expect that uh, that ship speeds is is going to is going to come down. Actually, the in the last uh, year, while we have had lots of congestion in in, in global supply chains, the ships have been going, going all out. Uh, speed-wise, in order to, if you will, catch up as many delays as 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 possible. As as things uh, normalize, you, we should also expect um, the uh, the ships to come down to normal cruise speeds. This is really important for our our fuel efficiency because, uh, as you, as you well know, the fuel consumption is not a linear curve with speed; it's exponential. And the last few uh, knots of, of of speed really adds to the the fuel consumption. So, so for us <clears throat> to continue the journey on fuel efficiency, we need to get the the speed of the ships down to the, if you will, the optimal level. Okay, so that's already already happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, we have another question. Um, from the audience, um, it says Maersk is investing, as we know, in becoming an end-to-end -end supplier, uh, supply chain uh, service provider. Um, and it says not all past such uh, similar attempts have uh, have been successful. So the question is, what's uh, what's changed? Look, first of all, I, I think that the uh, the market has changed, and the, the the demand for end-to-end -end logistics uh, solutions for uh, for for uh, for integrated logistics has has clearly gone up. That that's what that's why I believe we are growing so fast on 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 land side uh, logistics. The second thing that has changed is, has has been that that we actually set out on this uh, this journey, this integrated logistics journey, back at the end of two thousand and sixteen. And in those years, in the, the years that have passed since then, we have we have um, we have grown our capability. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the people we have, we have grown our capabilities when it comes to our tech platforms. We have made a number of uh, uh, acquisitions that, that that really have fit into into the integrated uh, uh, vision, and and, uh, and 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 then the customers have uh, have really uh, uh, responded uh, well. We expect to uh, probably be close to fifteen billion dollars. Uh, of revenue in in logistics uh, this year, uh, 
and that will be more than 30% organic uh, organic growth compared to, to last year when we did uh, just under 10 billion. So a massive, uh, massive uh, uh, increase. We have, of course, also added some acquisitions, but 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 we see lots and lots of uh, lots and lots of demand. The pandemic has meant that our customers are con reconsidering their global supply chains. They're thinking about uh, how much uh, inventory they have and, and where it is. Uh, obviously, the simplest way to make supply chains more resilient, that's by having more in inventory. They're thinking about how many suppliers they have and where, where they're located, which are you know, meaning that many of our customers are saying we cannot just rely on one supplier and certainly we cannot just rely on one country. So many, many uh, for, for that specifically means many are moving part of their production out of China. That, that complicates and fragments supply chains and actually makes it even more important that you have a good logistics provider that can help you keep control of your supply chain. Most of our customers also have to think now in terms of omni-channel uh, supply chain so that they can both fulfill, uh, if you will, good, uh, goods to, to physical stores and to, to, uh, to the consumers directly. All of these things together means that, that uh, uh, our customers see the need for integrated logistics and, and that's really the growth that we are, we are tapping, uh, tapping into. I think we can take quite some pride in, in the growth we have seen in logistics Uh, not just from a top line point of view, but we have actually also in the last six quarters had uh, EBIT margins uh, above above six percent in line with our our target. So so the growth is not coming at the expense of profitability. Okay. Thank you for that. So moving on to the next question of um, our topic of of inflation. Now that's of course a new reality to to most of us, and and one thing is how customers uh, react to high inflation. Uh, you know, buying less in stores, which of course impacts your business. But for your for your company specifically, you know, I'd like to I'd like to ask um, about wage inflation. Um, uh, you know, how big an issue is this for for a global company um, like Maersk? Would you say this is one of your biggest uh, headwinds at the moment? So 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 clearly, if you look at at our company, we we. Uh, This year will be probably be uh, around 80 billion dollars or north of 80 billion dollars of turnover. We our salary sum is is uh, around six six billion. So less than 10 percent of our total cost is 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 uh, salary. Uh, of course, we're quite an asset uh, intensive uh, company, and that's why in in the big scheme of things, salaries is less less than uh, less than 10 percent. But with, with that being said, obviously. <laughs> Uh, salary inflation is also it will also impact our margins, and therefore it's something that we, uh, you know, we work very diligently uh, with and, and trying to figure out how can we, um, how can we counter, if you will, the salary increases with improvements in in, in productivity, and and the the imp productivity improvements we have, uh, you know, send a quite a uh, quite a lot around, uh, if you will, new tech platforms that help us automate uh, automate the work. Whether that's in logistics or whether that's in the that's in the ports, uh, you know that that's really what we are. Uh, I think pretty much any any business can can do. You know, we we're going to have to pay large higher salaries when there's higher inflation. I think that's that's the uh, that that's the only uh, that's the only thing we can do. There's uh, there's in many markets uh, a tight tight labor situation, and even if that improves a little bit with inflation i think we will still for the right talent have to to pay quite competitive salaries and, and they will go up with inflation okay. um uh, they will go up because of inflation i don't think they will go up with inflation uh and and the only thing we can do as a business is try to figure out how can we match that that growth in salaries with inflation uh or, excuse me with uh, with productivity uh, enhancements and, and efficiency drives So some some companies have done, you know, various things. Uh, some of us, the, the favorite seems to be one time. We 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 follow our normal uh, uh, cycle for for salary adjustments, which uh, has you know that everybody that works for Maersk is is quite for, for familiar with. So the next time we need to consider uh, salary increases will be in in the uh, in 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 the first uh, quarter, and and we will try to land that. Uh, land that in in, 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 in in a good way uh, for for our employees uh, but certainly also 
uh, for us. We, we need to stay competitive uh, also. Uh, and that's, that's why we have uh, as much focus as we have on, on efficiency drives and, and productivity to, to try to match uh, the salary increases. Okay. I think I remember, recall, uh, was it last year you, you, you gave uh, employees a, a sort of an extra large uh, Christmas or New Year bonus. Are you doing anything this year to, um, to basically help uh, staff through uh, you know, uh, costly <laughs> rising energy bills and, and so forth? Yeah, so, so I think it's, it's too early. It, it is true that in the last two years, actually, because of the pandemic and all the extra uh, work that our colleagues have had to do globally, we have provided everybody in the company with an extraordinary uh, Christmas, uh, Christmas bonus. Uh, we, we, we have not yet considered what we will do, uh, uh, do what, 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 if anything, we will do this, uh, this year. But I, I don't think there's a company out there that does not think about what does this uh, inflation mean for us and try to make some, some sensible, uh, uh, sensible choices in the, in the coming uh, months as they are normal, uh, in, a, in line with their normal salary uh, adjustment cycles. Okay. And those, those salary increases, you, you're confident you can pass those on to, onto your customers or will you also feel this in, in your... So certain parts of our business actually do have, uh, do have, uh, if you will, CPI inflation uh, mechanisms or adjustments in 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 their contracts, particularly in the ports business, parts of the logistics business that is very people uh, people in intensive. But but again, it's not our objective to increase uh, uh, prices to the customers because of salary. It, it, I mean, I really would like us to to try to uh, mitigate as much as we possibly can by becoming more uh, more productive, deploying more technology, uh, more automation, and and uh, then we'll I'm sure we'll work it out one way or the other. Has it has it become uh, more difficult uh, to to uh, to find or to hire talent um, this this year um, because of partly because of the, the high inflation. And the market situation. I think we've had in the last few years actually quite a, quite tight labor markets uh, in many many countries around uh, the world, and certainly for some of the areas where we have been hiring a lot, particularly in in technology, so software engineers and and software architects and data scientists, but also in in logistics uh, where we have been growing so much and have been adding more than five thousand uh, people just in the last year. So, so, so there's, there's been a relatively tight uh, labor market. I also have to say, though, that we, we, we are able to attract uh, uh, people, to, people to Maersk. We, of course, do pay a, a competitive uh, you know, package, but, but even more importantly, I think a lot of people like the, what we do, like the purpose of the company, the international nature, and, 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 and so on. So, so, uh, so we are able to... Uh, uh, we are able to attract uh, people, and and we have also, uh, thankfully, been able to uh, retain uh, a, a lot of people. We have not in in Musk, uh, at least not yet, really seen uh, seen this uh, so-called great uh, resignation. Our attrition levels are are pretty much as they 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 always been. So, so right now, you know, we we, we feel relatively good about the, the the situation, but recognizing it is a tight market out there. And we need to be we need to be competitive, and then we need to offer a really good, you know, challenging job to our, our new colleagues, uh, 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 jobs that help develop them uh, and make 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 them better. Okay, there's there's one more question um, from the audience. So, in your pursuit of uh, of end-to-end -end services, uh, is the uh, the M and A strategy to to acquire targets at a premium to in, to ensure you you scale up quickly? So, in other words, are you are you overpaying for for targets? Well, we have we have we have done uh, I think two handful of acquisitions uh, by now in in the logistics uh, space, and uh, I think we've 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 done so uh, made a number of quite successful uh, acquisitions. As we are building up in this space, uh, pretty much all of the acquisitions we have made, the the the. Uh, we we have been we have been looking for for companies that what we what we call good companies. So what do I mean by that? Well, companies that are that are profitable, that have good leadership, 
that have good facilities, if that's relevant, good tech platforms, if that's that's relevant, but most importantly, have good products that we immediately can take and sell to our customers in, in, uh, in Ocean. So the way we are paying for the acquisition premium has been to supercharge the growth of the companies we acquire by selling their products, not to the companies, acquisition, acquired companies, customers, but also to the 70,000 uh, customers we have in, in Maersk in our Ocean business. And, and some of the companies that we have acquired, uh, you know, early on, uh, they are now two or three times the size they were when we, we acquired them. So, so that's how we have been, if you will, driving commercial synergies. Uh, and, and, and of course, as we build up the, our logistics business, we will also increasingly be able to drive uh, cost uh, synergies as we, as we, as we acquire uh, companies also going forward. Okay, okay. But then again, you also, uh, I mean, uh, you know, you put you back in 2016 when you when you made this uh, uh, decision to uh, to make uh, to make it an integrated company. You put yourself in a in a situation where you didn't have a you didn't have a choice but to grow quickly, right? So, do you, I mean, do you understand the, the concern from from people looking on from outside? Yeah, sure. But I mean, just you know. The first acquisition we made was uh, actually Hamburg Süd. Uh, we paid more than $3 billion for, for Hamburg Süd in, in 2017. And we had all the money back in, in, in three and a half years. So, so that was a very successful acquisition. And, and then we have, we, have, we have done all of the, the two handfuls of acquisitions in the logistics space. And we're still delivering, uh, if you will, quite uh, quite these. We're growing uh, really, really fast, more than 30% organically. And then we add uh, at uh, the acquisitions on top of that. And we are doing, delivering that growth at, at very healthy margins above uh, 6%. So, so, you know, I mean, you can always discuss, are you paying a little bit too much? Uh, I don't know, but, but, but what I'm looking at is, is, you know, the overall business, how is, that, how is that performing? And then it's important to say that where we are in our journey, we would rather pay a little bit too much for a good company with good products, with good leadership, good people, good technology, uh, uh, because that allows us to take the products of that company and sell them to our ocean clients, as opposed to buying a turnaround case where we have to do a lot of work just to get that company up to speed, even if we, we could get it you know, uh, cheaper. So we'd rather pay a little bit uh, higher and get a good company and, 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 and accelerate the growth of that company as opposed to yeah, try to make a cheap deal and then have to work a lot with the company afterwards. Okay, okay. I'd like to move quickly on to, on to asking you about the green transition, um, but we, are, we have another uh, question that seems to be very popular on, uh, it says, how, how valuable will participation in the 2M Alliance uh, be going forward if, uh, if growth interests uh, differ from, from, um, from MSC? Look, we, we have we have had uh, 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 you know what is now five six six seven six years of uh, collaboration with two M in uh, in uh, in uh, with with MSC and two M and 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 that that alliance has generated lots of uh, value uh, for us uh, and and I'm, I'm sure it will uh, continue to deliver value. First of all, it gives us a lot of cost savings in terms of being able to uh, offer a much bigger network uh, at, you know, at lower cost. Uh, but it also gives us operating flexibility in terms of the agility when it comes to adjusting capacity and, and, and so on. Whether one is uh, slightly bigger than the other uh, in, in, in that, I don't think really matters a lot to the value that is being uh, driven by, by, by the combination of uh, our, our, our fleets. Okay. So moving on to the green tran green transition, you, you took back in 2018. You took a uh, a decision to achieve net zero uh, emissions by 2050. I think that was moved forward to 2040 later. Um, so it, it it looked like a bold move um, at the time, but of course the green transition have has since gained uh, lots of traction. Um, the question is, what's happening now? Um, we all we all know about the the economic uncertainties, the the growing economic burden had fizzled the euphoria over the uh, the green transition. So uh, so the big question is, 
uh, whether your, your customers are still buying into carbon neutrality proposition. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this, uh, this, uh, th this train has left the, the station probably quite a long time ago. In 2018, we set out to become carbon neutral in 2050. We didn't have much of a plan for how to actually do that, neither from a technical pathway point of view, nor from a customer uh, buy-in uh, point of view. But we thought it was important to, to make, that, uh, take, make that ambition or set that target uh, and, and, and really then get to, to work on it. By, 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 by the January of this year, we, we decided to uh, re, re increase the ambition by moving the target to 2040, but actually even more importantly, set concrete targets for 2030, uh, because, which means that every decision we make now, uh, investment-wise, will have to be seen in the light. Will it help us become more uh, carbon neutral by 2030? We've seen in this period, we figured out how to do the, do the carbon uh, neutrality on the ships, the technical pathway, uh, uh, moving to, to, uh, to green methanol as, as the fuel. And we have invested in the first ships that can use that kind of fuel. And we will have those delivered by, by the middle of this decade in three years, two years. And, and, uh, and, and, and every ship that we invest in from now on will, will, will be able to to run on, on, on green methanol. At the same time, we have launched a, a carbon neutrality, carbon neutral shipping product. We call it Eco Delivery, based on biodiesel. And that, that product is growing uh, exponentially. It's probably going to be 2% of our volumes this year that will move uh, as Eco Delivery uh, product. And, and, I, and I really see lots of uh, you know, customer, uh, customer demand. In, in, in fact, more than two thirds of our customers uh, today have set their own science-based targets to become carbon neutral somewhere between 2030 and 2050, depending on which what kind of company it is. And, and, and if all, in order for our customers to, to, to deliver on their targets, they need to be able to buy carbon neutral uh, products. That's why we have it on the shelves and we see plenty of, of customer demand, even at a time where they have to pay a green premium uh, uh, in order to get the carbon neutrality. Okay, but, but I still, I guess you still have to get that to 100% because what, what looks like a good proposition for a big brand to be able to say that this shoe is uh, carbon neutral, uh, you know, it may not be the case for many other companies that are just looking to, to ship goods from, from A to B as cheaply as possible. So, I mean, the question is, could there be that there's less willingness to go green, uh, you know, as many companies just struggle to pay the energy bills? Yeah, so so I I think there are a couple of things at play here. One is of course uh, brands uh, have a have a different views than sub suppliers or not people selling uh, non 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 branded uh, goods. But but this development can take different forms. I mean, one thing is of course that the fuel price continues to stay very high. Uh, the, the 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 oil price stays very high. That has closed the gap quite significantly to the for the for the green fuels. So the, 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 the increase in the oil price that we have seen uh, in the last, uh, or in, during this year, you know, that's, if, that's the same net effect as a carbon, carbon tax. So, so, uh, so, so that narrows the gap and makes the extra cost for green fuel um, much smaller. Secondly, the green fuel industry is gonna scale and that I'm sure will bring down uh, cost as well uh, to, to, to narrow the gap to, to uh, regular fuel. Uh, and, then, and then finally, there is, I think, a reason to believe that, that in global shipping, there could be uh, a carbon tax uh, at some point uh, towards the end of this uh, decade, at least the ambition levels in the IMO for green transition uh, and carbon neutrality, um, we, we believe are, are going up. So, so um, we think we have plenty of customers that want to scale with us on this journey uh, in this, this decade. What happens in 2030 to get to 100% uh, by 2040? Obviously, we have to have parity on the fuel price, uh, but that can happen in different ways. More, uh, just a higher oil price or, or, uh, or a carbon tax or you know, whatever, we'll, we'll have to see. The point is, for me, when I talk to our customers, green transition is clearly uh, on the uh, agenda. 
lots of people have set targets. Lots of people want to be able to recruit good talent out there. And for most large companies, that also means having a, a progressive uh, attitude towards the green, green transition. Okay. I think we only have one or two, one or two minutes left. But on the, on the green fuel market, um, you've, had, you've had made a partnership with, with Egypt, and it looks like you may yourself uh, go and you know, invest in, in production of green fuels. And how do you see the, the future green fuel market look like? Um, and where do, where do you plan to, and by who do you want to buy this green fuel from and where? Yeah, so, so clearly Maersk is not looking to become, uh, uh, if you will, a, a fuel producer uh, uh, at, at scale. I mean, we are, we are a global uh, integrated logistics company, and, and that's how we see ourselves in the future. But it's also very clear that, that we, we ha there's a role to be played in terms of becoming, being a, a midwife uh, of, of a new green fuel uh, industry. And we're playing that role in a couple of ways. You know, first of all, we are prepared to sign Uh, off -take, long term off take agreements with people that will produce green fuel for us and that that enables such projects to be financed uh, both equity wise and 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 debt wise and 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 get get production going and then we're considering whether in whether there are areas where we also need to uh, invest a little bit of of our own money in order to get projects uh, off the ground but again it's not our objective to to become a, a fuel company and and it's you know we would prefer others to to take on that role uh, particularly those that are selling us fuel today uh, but until they they do so we we are we are trying to help things along by 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 being uh, as i said uh, a midwife for, for a new green fuels uh, industry okay uh son i think we've uh, <laughs> we've reached the end of our our time frame here so I'd like to say uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, for joining us today and thanks for to all the viewers and listeners out there. Um, I'll say um, goodbye and uh, see you next time. Thank you, Jan. Thanks for having me.